Back once again with another exciting personality filled intro and somebody asked me, they said, Ian, did you just record a handful of these intros all at the same time on the same dog walk and just change the position of your hoodie slightly each one to make it look like you were actually doing separate days? And I said, how did you get into my house? Porting a game used to be a funny old thing. See, in the past we had things called different gaming devices. These DGDs, as nobody called them, also had this bizarre feature whereby they all had different strengths and weaknesses. A far cry from the two main machines of today with their practically interchangeable gizzards. It meant that rather than pretend we can see the difference between something running at upscaled 1440p versus native 4K, there were clearly defined differences. Ones that were easy to spot, ones that sometimes could be a bit embarrassing if you owned a particular format. Take the Amiga for example, one of nature's finest creations, one of the world's best games machines, a legend in my own mind, and something that I feel pity for you poor Americans watching this over, as only about 12 of you ever bought one so you really did miss out on a hell of a lot of great stuff. You also missed out on the Amiga ports of the Street Fighter 2 series, meaning you missed out on one of the best selections of Bedori ports I've ever seen. It was, as you'll see, quite the roller coaster. It looks like a farce, I know, but bear with me here. This isn't going to be a usual YouTube angry cynical, oh look at me hating on things just because approach, because Street Fighter 2 on the Amiga, well, no, it wasn't very good. In the grand scheme of things, it was pretty bad. But there are a lot of caveats, and there's a lot to pull apart in this one, all of which leaves me with as warm an opinion of the game as I had all those years ago on first getting it. See, in 1992, Street Fighter 2 was one of the biggest things in the world. Problem was it wasn't coming to the Amiga, and we didn't have a SNES by that point where the game had made its de facto home outside of the arcades. The Amiga, so we were told, wasn't a good enough gaming machine to be able to give us the street fighting fighters of the street we also craved. It couldn't wrangle the sprites or keep up the pace, and it certainly couldn't give you six buttons to control your characters, given the usual Amiga joystick had a whopping one button. And, well, whoever was doing all that naysaying was right. But we did get the impossible dream on the Amiga. Street Fighter 2 released in 1992, coincidentally just before Christmas, published by US Gold and developed by the largely unknown team Creative Materials. On those four discs of Fury we had it all. The levels, the characters, the bonus stages, the lot. It wasn't as colourful as in the arcade, sure, but it did look the part with big chunky characters lobbing fireballs at each other. It was a minor miracle that content-wise we were able to get all of those main front-of-house features in the game. I mean, four discs, so a lot of disc swapping, but still. Naturally, as you've been seeing for a bit now, it didn't exactly run well. Slow and choppy, animations missing, fundamentally stupid contextual controls thanks to that one-button system. Honestly, contextual controls in a fighting game? Come on! Endless little idiosyncrasies like how Dalzim's low attack was practically unblockable for some reason, or you'd always try and throw your opponent, also for some reason. The music wasn't attached to the stage you were on, the backgrounds were static, the sound was rough. It was just thoroughly shoddy and definitely verging on outright bad. I loved it. I could see there was something wrong. I'd played the SNES version. I wasn't blind to what other people were playing in their homes, but it didn't matter. The sheer effort that had gone into this port was admirable, and rather than a flushed out turd of a game, Street Fighter 2 on the Amiga showed itself to be a real effort almost a triumph in bringing a game to a system that it just absolutely did not want to come to. It wasn't just the desperation of wanting Street Fighter 2 on the Amiga, it was the lengths the devs went to, or at least what they were forced to do. Capcom essentially farmed the port out and largely ignored it. No source code was provided, just an arcade board from which the developers had to reverse engineer the game's AI. From there, the devs played a lot of the SNES game to try and nail the feel of Street Fighter 2. No hit tables, no specific explanations of things, they were very much close to working blind on the whole thing. And they weren't helped by the Amiga's lack of speedy unified storage. The game amounted to around 3 megabytes in size, so larger than the 2 megabyte or 16 megabit SNES cartridge, but spread across those aforementioned four discs. 
Of the three megs, about 16 kilobytes was code, and the rest of it made up of AI scripting, graphics, and those other bits and pieces you'd need for a game, all spread about and jury-rigged into fitting into the Amiga's architecture. It was, as they say, tough going. Amiga magazines of the time were near universal in their praise of Street Fighter 2, the best fighting game on the platform, as close to the arcade as we're ever likely to get, the usual nonsense the press churns out. Amiga Power remained cool on it, but even they scored it surprisingly high at 74%. The weeks, months and years that followed saw the likes of Body Blows and Shadow Fighter come out though, and with each re-release review of Street Fighter 2 its score dropped more and more as the journalists realised that Actually, we'd all been sold a bit of a pup. The hysteria suitably drowned out, thoughts moved on to other things. After all, there was no chance Super Street Fighter 2 would come to the Amiga, and if it did, it would obviously be awful. Yep, it looks even worse. Super Street Fighter 2 couldn't even hide behind the power of still imagery in magazines, looking shonky in the extreme from day one and filling us, dear readers, with a sort of quiet dread usually reserved for having to stand up and speak in front of an assembled group, or having to leave the house at all ever. This time around, the SNES and Mega Drive versions weren't quite heralded as arcade perfect like the previous ports had been, but they were both more than adequate conversions. The Amiga port was looking like a mess, frankly. Super Street Fighter 2 on the Amiga, though, took a different approach to its forebear. Publisher US Gold returned alongside a new developer in the form of Freestyle, a studio with just the one Amiga credit to its name by 1995. Mr. Blobby. Hmm. But this shift to a new developer also marked a shift to a new approach. As well as actually being provided with things like hit tables and source code, more on that in a second, Freestyle focused not on making the game look like a solid facsimile of the arcade game, but instead pushed for a game that played like the arcade. A lot of visual compromises were quite obviously made, but the end result was a genuinely very good conversion of Super Street Fighter 2 on a format that shouldn't have been able to handle it even if it did look like a fresh dog poo on a hot summer's day. To that source code point, there's confusion from my research as to if it was from the arcade, with some places saying it was actually the Super Street Fighter 2 Mega Drive source code. Either way, Freestyle, like created materials before, it looked more to the consoles for inspiration on how the port should play, which again made sense given it was easier to get the SNES and Mega Drive versions in an office. But that source code helped out by providing things that could be directly used on the Amiga, like sprites. It wasn't straightforward, the team had to comb through the code to find anything usable, and that it did discover had to be converted into a usable format, and the sprites were extracted in pieces and so had to be assembled manually by the developers, using the SNES version as a visual reference. Thinking about it, this was a team effort by both the SNES and Mega Drive to try and help the Amiga do something great. In the end, Super Street Fighter 2's Amiga outing featured just about all the frames of animation, the moves, the backgrounds, the sounds, the music, everything. It was heavily compromised in terms of looks, with a ludicrous letterbox taking up a good two-thirds or so of the screen, sure. And yes, it was on seven discs and needed about a decade to load anything if you were running off a single disc drive. And sure, if you were using a regular joystick it didn't control particularly well. But installed to a hard drive and played with a 6-button CD32 controller or a wireless Mega Drive pad like the one I use on my Amiga today, you had a brilliant, hideous, fantastic, comedic port of the game. It was both entirely different from, yet hugely similar to, the SNES and Mega Drive versions and highlights one of the best examples of bizarre portery from gaming's history. With the news that Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo would be coming to the Amiga as well, an early screenshot showing something that looked exactly like the arcade version, our bodies were ready. This would be it. Combine the better looks of the first port with the incredible fun of the second one, and it would be the final all-conquering truth. The Amiga deserved a full and proper Street Fighter 2 game. Nope. Garbage. Absolute joke. Completely the other direction. Super looked trash on the page, but played like a dream, whereas Turbo looked like a dream on the page and played like an absolute nightmare. A nightmare running at about three frames a century, and one that had the temerity to release mere months after that actual good dream we'd all had before. I'm getting my metaphors and similes and whatever mixed up. Super Street Fighter 2 on Turbo was, is, and always will be sheer terrible rubbish. 
enough to mix up my thought process and make me say weirder stuff than normal. All production duties had changed hands for this one, with publishing done by Game Tech and development handled by Humansoft. This time though, Capcom finally relented and handed over the direct source materials. This meant the port could use the AI, the data, the graphics, the sounds, everything as it should have been done. All it needed was a bit of tweaking to fit inside the constraints of the Amiga's hardware and things would be fine. Apparently Humansoft didn't even do a bit of tweaking and no polishing, and absolutely no refinement suited to the platform. Your internet isn't failing you, YouTube is not buffering. This is how the game runs on a modern spec'd up Amiga 1200 with a frankly ridiculous and expensive expansion card in it. Featuring a faster processor than stock and hundreds of megabytes extra RAM, I couldn't run it on better hardware if I tried, and still this is what I got. Across 11, yes, 11 discs, Turbo at least acknowledged its newfound mega size by demanding a hard drive install. It wouldn't work without one, meaning, at the very least, a fair portion of the Amiga owning public was saved from this particular horror, given hard drives were not standard on the computer. When it was standing stock still, Turbo also looked great. It really did look like a close approximation of the arcade version. It had some options on it. I'm clutching at straws for my positive paragraph of praise here. This really was one of the worst ports of anything ever. Just listen to the criticism levelled at the game by CU Amiga magazine in its review. With no chance for me to iron out the jerky animation, coupled with the lack of music during fights and the periodically poor collision detection, what we are left with is a fighting game with excellent graphics that fails to give me the fluidity of feel present in Mortal Kombat 3 or Shadow Fighters a shocking indictment of the game, and it's no surprise the score at the end of that harsh critical take came in so low at just 80, 83%. My word magazines used to be stupid. Awful magazines from the past aside, Turbo would release to little fanfare, be ignored and largely forgotten. A fair few Amiga owning chums from back in the day don't even know the machine got a turbo port, and really I think I'm doing them and you a disservice by pointing it out if you weren't already aware. As well as it running like your tummy following a visit to Barry's Bargain Curry Vault, the game also had one of my favourite features of anything ever. See, Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo added in super moves, those high powered combos that could be used to hit your opponent for big damage or finish them off in spectacular fashion. They were in the Amiga version, as they should have been, except the game had a wonderfully quaint way of either glitching out when the super move was activated or outright crashing the entire game. An actual selling point for the entire game, a point of difference between it and the previous Street Fighter 2 games, and it literally broke the game to use it. I thought I had a dodgy WHD load install on my A1200, I really did. Then I read some contemporary reviews of Turbo that pointed out the crashing and it all became clear. The past was not better. It was still full of money-grubbing parasites out to ruin your good times by foisting half-baked rush nonsense on the market. Everyone remembers Street Fighter 2 on the Amiga and how badly that turned out, but god, compared to Turbo, at least it was honest. Bye!